Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. You already know what the opening is going to be, Evan. Oh, I know. <laughs> so we we just we've actually been talking for five minutes now. Um, we had a we had a good opening. We told a story. I'll tell it to you again in a second. And uh, Evan unmuted, and I was like, "Man, three minutes, thirty seconds in, and Evan's already going. This is gonna be a good episode. Evan's into it. He's got a story to tell. And what does he tell us? The uh, video is not recording. <laughs> Which admittedly i can understand why that was difficult because we only asked evan is the video recording twice right before we started recording so i can understand how we Not it, today it was, <laughs> did oh early <laughs> we have a process you ask me if it's going and then i check and then i start it that's the process um and i love this i i love that that is how our night started because the story i'm about to tell is uh, about familiarity <clears throat> <laughs> so um it's a good thing i think we're funny otherwise i wouldn't have a good time telling a story again but let me paint a picture for you about my uh night on what was it monday something like that uh we got a we had a couple things to kind of uh disperse so i got some merch some samples that we're trying out and i want to bring some to evan because it's a polo a golf polo so naturally um that piqued his interest and then also arjun shanker uh one of our um name level sponsors but most more importantly our friend uh sent us some gifts and he sent us something for the studio which will show off at, a, at another time and uh sent some stuff to to brad and evan but mostly it was for mika he got her very kindly um assigned andreas hathenis you puck which was really really kind of him she was thrilled um so we oh, have i'll tell it now since i forgot to tell it the first time through he also sent me a bunch of andreas hathenis you cards those were in my possession for all of four seconds. Oh, yeah. There was no chance those were going to stay. There was zero chance I was going to get to keep those. Um, so since the you know these trying times have started, it's been near on a year, and we have not seen each other. We've not been in the same room. The closest we've been has been these guys came to my front porch to pick up some equipment right what, like right after we started so we can you know record remotely as easily as possible. So I was pumped. I was like, Hey, I get to see my friends. I haven't seen these guys in so long. It'll be cool to just like, and we're not going to hang out, hang out, but I'll just stand in the driveway or the front doorstep and we'll talk for a little bit. So, uh, I go to Evans first and he's like, Hey, just give me a warning. So I was like, all right, I gave him a 20 minute warning and I get there and I ring the doorbell and, uh, no one answers. And I'm like, that's weird. He told him I was coming. And I checked my phone and Evan had just messaged me then saying, oh, I'm just leaving the grocery store now. It's just, uh, but Kat's at home. And I was like, yeah, she's at home, but it's also, you know, pitch black outside. I'm wearing a dark hoodie with the hood up and I ha I'm ringing the doorbell with a gift in my hand and it's just her and her toothless cat at home. So very clearly, Kat's not going to be answering, answering the door. So I put it down and I walked away. I was like, oh, well, that's a bummer. But now I get to go see um Brad and Crystal, but more importantly, um, Mika and Hank. So I drive over to Brad's and uh, Brad answers the door, smiling as he does, which I was like, wow, I forgot how annoying that was in person. <laughs> and uh, I actually, I think the first thing I said to you, Brad, was I think you got shorter, which I think physically might be true. Osteoporosis is kicking in. Good chance. Um, Mika runs up and uh, me being the very tough stoic guy I am, almost immediately wanted to well up because she had gotten so big and I hadn't seen her in a year. And uh, I said, hi, Mika. And, you know, we were chatting a little bit. And I was like, well, uh, I just gave your daddy a, uh, a box and has a present for you in it. And she immediately ripped it out of Brad's hands, grabbed the, the puck, the still wrapped puck and sprinted away. And I was like, all right, I'll see you next year then. <laughs> and uh, Hank didn't come out because apparently he sleeps at 630, which I don't know. I know nothing about kids. And uh, yeah, that was uh, I had a lot of hopes that night and I drove home. <laughs> <laughs> thanks guys you got abandoned by evan used by a four-year-old completely ignored by a one-year-old yeah sounds about right for just my life in general and the only person excited to talk to me was you which like <laughs> god what did i do in a past life you know ah uh, no i'm kidding it was nice to see your face in person um but we'll probably not do that again for another 12 months i think it's for the best 
Yeah. You saw me pre haircut too. So you got to see my, uh, my final caveman moments. Yeah. You looked rough. I like felt rough. Now. <laughs> now I still feel rough, but now people can't see it visibly on me. <laughs> oh boy. Anyways. Uh, welcome to the winged wheel podcast. Uh, I'm Ryan Hanna. I'm Mika's dad. And I'm Evan. Uh, on this episode of the podcast, we have plenty to talk about with the Red Wings. They played a game. Uh, I can tell you now, Brad's going to have some feelings. Um, we'll talk <laughs> about that game. We'll talk about special teams. Uh, we're going to talk about potential trade targets from the Red Wings, not for the Red Wings, from the Red Wings. Um, and then some news from around the league before jumping into uh, overtime. Okay, so games like what happened with Detroit last night. So um, it's currently Wednesday night. So on Tuesday night, the Red Wings lost 2-0 to the Predators. And uh, it's a bummer when these games happen, especially on the heels of putting together some half-decent performances. A 7-2 game uh, with Florida, not in there, of course. But um, other than that, they looked halfway decent. But there is a consistent theme across all those games, which is that the Red Wings are just aren't scoring goals. They're scoring less than two goals a game. I think the last time they scored over two goals was Saturday the 13th, also against Nashville. The game on Tuesday night was a stinker, like just through and through a stinker. Like there, there is very little good to pull out of that game. Nothing happened because no. Nashville also sucks. There was that weird goalie interference call. It's literally the only play, play from the first two periods I remember. Detroit took a couple dumb penalties in the third period. Nashville scored on the power play because if Red Wings fans aren't aware of this, teams are allowed to do that. And that was the game. That, that was it. I I remember, too, because I was watching the game, and I'm, I'm, tr- I'm at the point I have to try and keep myself angry because the apathy is just hitting hard this time of the season. And... When I do my game recaps after every game, and we've been doing it for a long time, I always, always, always try to remind myself, even if I don't put anything there for shock value or because like if you lose 7-2, whatever, I try to throw in a positive. So if you lose 2-0, that's a reasonably close game. I should have a positive beyond just the evergreen tweet of Jonathan Bernier is really good at hockey. And I sat there, and I sat there, and I sat there, and the best I could come up with was, eh, Christian Juice looked all right tonight. That was it. That was it. I couldn't say anything about any of the Red Wings' top players. I couldn't say anything about any of the Red Wings' depth players. I could not find anything viable to pull from that game. Because as much as I want to say, yeah, they held Nashville to two goals, probably should have been three depending on your view of how ticky-tack goaltender interference can get. But I digress. And then you remember Nashville is one of the worst offensive teams in the league. So if they played anywhere halfway decent, they lose that game 5 6 nothing. That's just the reality of it. So I swear I'm trying to not be the most negative Red Wings fan in the world, but God damn, they are making it difficult at some points throughout this season. <laughs> It's hard to be excited after a 2 nothing loss, especially as a Red Wings fan. But um, remember in the group chat how I said I didn't even realize there was a game on? Yeah, I realized well, that was not true because when I reopened my computer the next day, the game was still open on one of my browser tabs. <laughs> I, watched the, I watched the game and forgot I watched it. <laughs> I sent that message like 10 minutes after the game ended. <laughs> I know. I probably stopped watching sometime in the second period. That's I don't even remember when it was because clearly I didn't remember I even watched it. That's incredible. For sure, there's some kind of like uh, uh, net marketing score and they just try to capture the most elusive audience. And Evan's just like the perfect embodiment of if you can get this guy's eyes on all 60 minutes of the game, you're doing something right. And they made it like 13 minutes in, and they're like, damn it, guys, we messed it up. Not only that, I forgot about those 13 minutes. 
<laughs> it was guys I'm, I, I'm not kidding i sent this message in our chat and i think the message was that game sucked i just want to feel something um you know tuesday night and uh, that was literally within five minutes of the game ending i'm i'm almost positive it was like directly out for so i haven't some, i hadn't left the couch at some point during that game my brain just shifted away from the game and i turned my computer off and i totally forgot i watched it incredible that's not good yeah so is this game reason to call for you know hellfire and doom and gloom and this is some brand new issue for the red wings no i don't think so like i mentioned before and like brad has described the Red Wings played a sucky team who didn't make the game exciting from their end. The Red Wings have a goal scoring problem. Um, the Red Wings have a special teams problem, both on the power play and the penalty kill. Um, and so we hope for good defensive games, but half the time, you know, we get those as fans, it's still going to turn into a, a, a bummer of a game like that. So, you know, I didn't walk away surprised. Like, you know, Mel asked me how the game went, and I was just like, eh, it was the Red Wings. That's the, the the really crappy part about rebuilds. So speaking within reasonable adjustments that the Red Wings can be making, um, I'm going to do a very quick piece on the power play, and I'm not going to dwell for too long because we know and we've said it all, and until something changes, I don't think there's a point of drilling it into you. The Red Wings are now um, 0, 8, 0 for their last 36. I think they had just one power play last night. Yeah, they didn't uh, do anything to draw any. <clears throat> Yeah, 0 for, 0 for their last 36, 1 for their last 45. The record, I'm pretty sure, is 0 for 59 in a row or something to that effect. So I think they can do it. Uh, so nothing Fun doing fact. on the power play. Fun fact, that record happened to the Leafs in a year the Red Wings won the Cup. So that's just fun <laughs> all around. Um, and if you're a team as as bad on the penalty kill as the Red Wings are, and they are bad on the penalty kill, you can't be taking the kind of kinds of penalties they were taking, and you can't be taking four penalties in a night if you're going to draw one. Understandably, sometimes penalties are out of the player's control. But look, if you're not going to be scoring a lot on five on five and you're not going to deliver on the power play, you need to protect yourself in every way you can. And that means, you know, really cutting out the bullshit penalties, for lack of a better term. And that was the frustrating part. Again, you know, I wasn't throwing anything through the TV, but I was like, guys, you got to help yourself. Like, it's just not... There's small things they can do to help their game, even within the realm of sucking in a rebuild. And there's there was just none of that last night. No, absolutely none. This team looks like, yeah, the lack of talent's obvious. The lack of offensive firepower's obvious. But there's too many nights this team just looks listless. Like, they're just a bag waving in the breeze. There's not any energy there because... For And again, it's easy to pick on the bottom six player, so I'm not going to pick on a bottom six player here just to kind of hammer home the point. For years, for his entire career probably, Dylan Larkin has been advertised as maybe the most competitive player in the NHL. If not, he's a top 10. I've not seen that this year. I've seen it in flashes in some games, but Larkin doesn't look like himself. Mantha doesn't look like himself. Zadina, you could tell he is... He is gripping that stick so tight he's going to snap it in half without even taking a shot. I, it, it's it's frustrating. I, I think that's the worst part for me because I think we all went into the season, even with the little bit of optimism we had before the season, um, knowing there would be a lot of losses. But, hey, look at who they picked up. Maybe this will be entertaining losses. Maybe they'll lose by less. Maybe it'll be... No, it's not. It's just as bad as last year. The ratio of blowouts might have improved slightly, not by all that much. And the team just looks like they don't care. And then they, when, when you mentally check out from the effort level, you just mentally check out, which is what leads into dumb penalties from Patrick Nemeth and Vlad Nemesnikov that cost the team the game. Like I, I watched four replays of that Nemesnikov penalty. I can't for the life of me think of what he was doing there and he's an nhl veteran he's been around a long time this isn't like we'll use zadina like zina oh crap i lost position and then panic and do whatever you can no this was he came in there had half decent position on the forward and just reached around him and grabbed him like what he was jealous of larkin's rko from the other night he wanted his own honestly it's just it's (laughs) It's just, this is what's maddening to me. It's just that 
it's stupid. It's boring. And you can tell they're just not in it. And you, not that everybody's in it. Obviously, there's Red Wings players who you can visibly see are in it. Tyler Bertuzzi, who's injured. Giovanni Smith, who's in the minors. Troy Stetcher, who's injured. You know, those guys. Um, but I don't know. It's just, it's hard to not let the apathy set in at this point. Yeah, and like, I'm not saying never be negative. I, I think a lot of times people are like, oh, you're so overly negative. But, you know, a lot of times I think it's just... And I give you a lot of credit here, Brad. You're not afraid to call things out, you know, when you see them. Uh, what I do is I try to give things some time to see, is this going to flip back? Is this just a little glitch? I'm probably a little bit generous in that regard, even. Apathy is almost, I don't know, a strategy. Not like I don't care. Like, I love I love this team. I love watching the sport. I, I love covering it. I love what we do. But I don't. I go in with no expectations at this point. I go in with no expectations. There's one thing to be, you know, overly negative when your team is President's Trophy candidate, a contender. That's one thing because then it's <clears> like, well, least. this is a great team. Like, get off their ass. But when it, they're this bad, it's like, at some point, you got to stop being a loser. <laughs> Put that. Tattoo that on the inside of my eyelids, please. To quote Rowan, <laughs> me <please. too. laughs> Yeah. At some point, like this team's got to turn around the other side, right? Like, and until then, you're, they're going to get treated like losers. Like it, it sucks, and I hate watching the games, and I forget that I watch the games. It's clearly clearly a coping mechanism at this point. But like, what are we supposed to say? Like, oh. They're they're looking better. Like it's it this is it's a dark hole right now. And going get back to what Ryan said, and and I appreciate you saying that. Hey, it, it's nice that you're willing to call things out a little quicker than I am. But here's the thing: I'm not. I actively make a point to try to not overreact to something the first time I see it because there's always context. You got to look at the greater picture or play or whatever it might be about. Okay, well, why did this happen? I don't think I've bitched about a single thing this year that I haven't bitched about a hundred times before. I think that's, if I had to boil it down to one thing this year about why I feel almost angrier watching the team this year than last year is because it's just, it's the same garbage over and over and over. And we haven't even talked about the lineups they were running in practice today, which will further hammer home that point. But We've seen this team suck on the power play. We've seen this team suck on the penalty kill. We've seen this team struggle to break into the zone. We've seen this team struggle to get the puck out of their zone. We've seen all of this before. It's nothing new. I want a a, a new exciting way to be angry. Just something different. I want the goalie to suck. I want the Red Wings to outshoot a team 40 uh, careful to now. Come on. <laughs> I would rather the Red Wings outshoot Nashville 40 to 20 and lose 5-4 because Bernier let in 5 from center ice than to watch the same thing I've been watching for the last 4 or 5 years. And just a slow progression into getting worse at it. Like we know what Anthony Mantha is, so I don't know why people keep complaining that oh, he's big, he's slow, he's lazy. Well, deal with it it's what he is that's i get it but i mean that's far from the biggest issue on this team i people have turned on larkin i have got a ton of larkin haters in my mentions now i had someone literally uh begging for mike babcock to come back like this is what this team has done to us like there is no reality anybody should ever want mike babcock within a hundred feet of another human being but they're literally begging oh Bring back Babcock. That's what we need. Oh, come on. Well, he's he's got a good wife and good kids, man. Like, he, yeah, he maybe he's good for the team. Uh, uh, on Mantha, I said today, um, the, the discourse on Mantha is almost funny at this point. I'm surprised it's still going because I don't think anyone's wrong. You know, there is a contingent of people who are saying he is not moving his feet like he, he used to. He is not scoring or producing like we know he can. Uh, he is really underperforming based on the amount of talent that he's supposed to have. And I think that's true. And then there's another uh, – the opposite side is saying, 
well, he's still one of the best players on this team. And that's also true, even at his, you know, partial output. And yeah, the sad reality of it, like Brad said, is it just is what it is. Like, that's what Mantha is so far this year. You still hope for him to get better, of course, but it's not like Mantha's some outlier. The whole team is underperforming. Who's not underperforming? Jonathan Bernier? Troy Stetcher? Christian Juice? That's you're you're picking and choosing here. Like it's it's not a lot of of the those silver linings. The expectations, and, and not new, but the expectation this year is that they just sucked in a way that was normal. And that's not what we're getting yet. Still could. It still could, but I just have a hard time believing that, you know, this is only because Tyler Bertuzzi's out. Although, please, Bert, whatever it is, I hope he's week to week, so don't expect Bertuzzi to come back anytime soon. Um, he should not make that big of a difference in the lineup. I made a complaint at the end of uh, the game, and you know what? I was wrong about it because I was talking about how Philpola and Helm were two of the players out down two goals with 90 seconds left. And I really didn't take into proper consideration the fact that, you know, the star players were on for a long time before that and they were gassed. I still would have made the argument that I think Blashill should have called the timeout. I get why he didn't. The momentum, Nashville had just iced the puck. They were gassed too. You push. I don't really have a lot of belief in Darren Helm, who I think is at 12 games with no points now, um, putting in that puck or anything like that. But he's one player of six on the ice. So I was largely incorrect in, in that take, and I'll own that. But it also really just it shines another bad, dull light on the team, which is that like you lose Bertuzzi, and all of a sudden your top six is in disarray. This team has a long way to go, man. That's That's the takeaway. Is it? It, it's not the end of the world. They can come out next game and score four power play goals and pump Nashville five, nothing. And we're going to be pumped and thrilled. And we'll talk about it on Sunday and it'll be exciting. But for now, games like those, it's like, ugh, that is the low that we reached last season that we hoped we wouldn't have seen this season. So I'm glad you brought up the end of the game point And the fact that, cause I, I think I fell on the same to the same conclusion you did there where I wanted to kick and scream about those guys being on the ice. But yeah, the the top guys were literally on the ice for, I think it was close to two minutes before that. They were absolutely gassed. So sure, that's fine. Don't put them back out there. I, I guess there's nobody better than Val Philpola and Darren Helm to get out there. And there's where you lose a game before the game starts because it's a, a roster issue that isn't going to be fixed by the talent outside of the team, but it could be helped. I mean, so here's, I'm going to ask, I'm going to give you a list of Red Wings forwards, and I want you to take a guess what they have in common here. Val Philpola, Franz Nielsen, Adam Ernie, Sam Gagne, Matthias Brome, Darren Helm. No goals. Wait, no, you said Matthias Brome. Yep. Go through the list again. Val Philpola, Franz Nielsen, Adam Ernie, Sam Gagne, Matthias Brome, Darren Helm. All have played on the first line. All are still being outscored by Giovanni Smith. <laughs> who's been Superstar in Grand Rapids for weeks. I Again, you can argue all you want about what's best for these guys' development, and it, it's a valid argument because there is no correct answer. If you want to sit here... And tell me, being in Grand Rapids is better for Giovanni Smith, Michael Rasmussen, Dennis Cholosky, pick whatever prospect you want right now. It's better for them, and that's your only argument. I'll listen. I will legitimately listen. Uh, and on, on at least a couple of them, I will disagree with you, but I understand where you're coming from. For me, Giovanni Smith, I don't think has anything left to prove in Grand Rapids. He was... He was punching his weight in the NHL. So to me, that means it's time to develop in the NHL. But fine. I will hear the argument. However, the counter argument to this is, and I don't know who's to take the blame here. This could be an Eiserman thing. This could be a Blashill thing. If you are actively keeping players out of your lineup who can help you win. And you can't tell me Giovanni Smith wouldn't do that right now. You can't tell me Taro Hirose wouldn't do that right now. You're tanking. That's that is tanking the, and again, I've never been anti tank. I understand it. Like I, 
I don't want to go nu- I don't ever want to see a team or the Red Wings go nuclear like the Coyotes and the Sabres did a few years ago. Don't get me wrong. I'm not talking to that level. But I've been of the mindset and I have argued over the last couple of years the Red Wings aren't tanking. They just got they held on to the streak too long. They got old. They got bad. It happens. This year, I don't know. I don't know if I can make that argument because there are guys in Grand Rapids, in my opinion, who should be in Detroit, who aren't. There's a guy in Detroit who should be playing, but isn't. And I'm going to get back to that one. And yet, Darren Helm, zero goals, zero assists on the season. Plays every game that he's available. Plays on the first line. Franz Nielsen might be the worst forward in hockey is playing on the first line in practice today. Luke Glendening will routinely get over 15 minutes a game. Val Fibula gets power play time. You're either tanking or you are incredibly bad at talent ev- evaluation. That's I, I and I get it. I'm not even I'm not even going to say that's a bad thing. I'm just saying at this point I think we need to call it as it is, which to me hasn't been the case up until this season. Yeah. It's easy to lose sight of it because a lot of, you know, it's, it's easy to get wrapped up, wrapped up in Eisman's public statements and which is stupid because he tells us himself, don't listen to everything I say, or like, <laughs> don't read into it. Um, but Eisman's conversation publicly a lot has been a lot about posturing, which is, you know, this team can't suck forever. We need guys who can play, blah, blah, blah. That's what the GM is going to say every time. That's classic GM speak. It's not like Eisman's out there, like Brian Burke, you know, just telling it like it is. It's just not the way Eisman plays it, plays it close to the chest. So he's signing these guys and saying we need to bring guys in who can who can make us better and, and play. But yeah, by all rights, Brad, I think you're right. Like this reads like Eisenman is the guy who built the cup winning team in Tampa Bay and said, I did that because I had a bunch of star players who were super high picks. And uh, that's the way I know how to do it. And I'm not going to try to magic this team into winning with, you know, the Bobby Ryans and Vlad Nemesnikovs, no offense, but that's not what's going to move the needle in terms of making this team competitive. I need, you know, Shane Wrights. I need uh Savoy's I need all of these guys Brant Clark if you want Eklund if you want doesn't matter but you just need those high picks he sees how wonky this year is you know we always say the phrase PDO bender which is just a, a analytics way of saying you know a team gets goes on a hot streak and gets super lucky they're shooting at a high percentage the other team's goalie has a, a few bad nights in a row and all of a sudden you're going from one of the worst teams in the league to Oh, you're like sixth or fifth in your division, and you're way out of that that draft lottery. The way the league is designed right now, it rewards tanking to a point. It gets you in that like you're probably drafting fourth tier, and uh, the draft lottery also stops you from being able to guarantee first overall. And it just puts us in that sweet spot where he's not going to go nuclear like Arizona or Buffalo did. You know, it's not like Red Wings fans are going to be cheering for goals against them, but we're going to get situations like this. It's a depressing truth because like you said, it's not really, it's not really the wrong move long-term. The depressing part. I just trying to remember those that season, what Arizona and Buffalo did. I think they each finished with a higher points percentage that season than Detroit did last year and is on pace to this year. Yeah, yeah. The, when the special teams are this bad, like what's this? It's six point something right now. They're firing on the power play. Like it doesn't matter whether you meant to be this bad or not. If your power play can't score and you're not changing anything about it, I think Albert Einstein once said, if you don't change the way you run your power play or the personnel, you're going to suck all year. And that was his most famous quote from that German or Austrian uh, <laughs> physicist. My favorite stat of the year is the Red Wings are one of the worst teams in the league at producing five on five offense. At five on five, they produce more goals per 60 than they do on the power play. Yeah. St- statistically speaking, all the jokes we've been making about when the Red Wings get a power play, they should decline it are true. They, based on the stats this year, they literally are better off declining the power play if they need to score a goal. How if, is that possible? If Jeff Blasio lost that challenge, the uh, punishment actually would have been a Red Wings power play, believe it or not. 
Yeah, honestly. So the red, the Red Wings would be a would have a better strategy because obviously rules are rules. You can't actually dec- decline a power play if they take the fifth person on the ice and they force them to sit behind their own net. Just literally go behind Jonathan Bernier behind the net and just sit there for two minutes. It is a better strategy than what they're doing on the power play right now. I wish I could say that was sarcasm. The statistics back that up. <laughs> Anyways, uh, last game was a stinker. You know, Sveshnikov didn't call get called up. Although we we said last episode that was it wasn't guaranteed to happen right away, and it might still. I know I was trying to skate past it, Brad, but you won't let me. So no, because this is what we <laughs> said on the last one. We said we're going to give them the benefit of the doubt because we saw Franz Nielsen was waived. Okay. If they're actually waving Nielsen to scratch him to make room for Svechnikov, fine. I will uh, I will stop bitching about the fact that Svechnikov hasn't played a hockey game in over a week at the AHL or NHL level. Fine. If you want to, if they wanted to take a bit of extra time to get him skating with the wings to learn whatever the fuck system it is that they deploy, fine. I don't agree with it, but fine. As of today. He is the extra in practice, and Franz Nielsen is on the first line. I I don't need to explain that statement. I don't need to explain why that would make any Red Wings fan angry. I don't think I need to explain why that would confuse anybody who has even rudimentary knowledge of the game of hockey. You have a prospect. As, as far as his stock has fallen as a prospect there's still a chance he could be a usable NHLer. By the time he plays, it'll be a, it'll have been close to two weeks without him playing a single game. And Franz Nielsen, again, one of the worst forwards in hockey, was skating on the first line in practice today. Devil's advocate, and I'm sorry I have to do it. Fabry was hurt. It wasn't practicing right. Could have just been taking Fabry's spot. Okay. And um, all the other guys who have been healthy scratches are drawing back into the lineup in front of Svechnikov. I'm uh, I'm out of devil's advocate. <laughs> That's it. That's all I had in the bank there. I, I do not care what they do with Svechnikov in Detroit. I don't care if he plays on the fourth line. I don't care if he plays on the second line. I don't have all that high hopes for him. And I like Evgeny Svechnikov, and I tend to be more optimistic on him than other people. Whatever. He is. He is what he is. But you're doing nobody, the team, or him any favors by not playing him. If you're not going to play him, send him back to Grand Rapids. This is stupid. At some point, we have to start... I don't know if this is Blaschel's decision. Or to, like, Eisenman's like, here, here's a toy. Play with it. And Blaschel's just not. Or if this is what Eisenman wanted for whatever the hell reason when he calls up. But he's got to bear the responsibility of this because if Blaschel's not going to play him... Send him down. Uh, Jack Hahn, who's a great follow, by the way, uh, tweeted out a story. And it went something like this. Uh, the Leafs really like Nick Jensen, which wasn't you know, news uh, to us like if, or to Red Wings fans or to the hockey world. If you will go back and listen to those episodes when the Red Wings had Jensen and when they eventually traded him to Washington, uh, the Leafs were one of the teams in on him. He was a low-cost, really effective defender. Um, and they were also in on Glenn Denning that year because, you know, Babcock was still there and Babcock loves Glennie and, uh, they wanted Nick Jensen. So they could pair him with Travis Dermott. That's right. Right. I think that's who it was. And, uh, (laughs) and they told Babs to, to give him a heads up to see what he thought. He said, okay, trade for him. But uh, if you do that, I'm sending Dermott down. Like that's the kind of stubborn coach Babcock was. And I'm not saying that's what's happening with, with, uh, Jeff Blashell, no, but just when you were talking about that, Brad, like here's a toy, and then the coach decides he doesn't. That's not what he wants to do with it. Like it's happened, we've seen it happen. Okay, I know this isn't true, and I know there's a, a fraction of a percent this is the reason, but there's a small, a minuscule part of my brain, which is most of it, truthfully, that thinks. Blashill doesn't like Svechnikov. Eisenman recalled him. Blashill doesn't play Svechnikov. 
Eisman waves Nielsen. Blashill likes Nielsen, so he's like, screw you. I'm not playing Svechnikov, and I'm putting Nielsen on the first line. <laughs> there's a part, okay. there's a tiny, tiny part of my brain that almost hopes that's true just for the comedic factor. Please know that Brad, that was a joke. Please don't run with that. That's <laughs> no, no, no. Reasons. Yeah, that is not a theory that I actually think is happening. Just a small part of me wants it to happen, be the re- or wants it to be the reason. <laughs> so, the good news in all of this is that was but one game. By the time we talk next, the Red Wings will have played Nashville again, uh, Chicago, and Chicago again, and then we'll be—you'll have an episode from us late Sunday night after the second Chicago game. So, between those three games, something exciting will happen. We'll be able to draw more positives. But for now, um, some you know interesting theoreticals being thrown around. Very obviously, there's a handshake campaign around the uh, with the hockey men around the NHL to all talk up Mark Stahl, and though it's absolutely out of this world i do appreciate the efforts everyone's put forward because frank saravalli um named three red wings that teams have their eyes on and there's no one like athens cu level or higher this year but there are three players uh foremost bobby ryan who i think doesn't matter how he plays between now and the trade deadline people will target uh luke lendenning as is tradition but i have a feeling this is the year he actually gets moved because of his face-off dominance and you know, we joke about it it's because, like, what's the point of winning the face-offs if you're not going to do anything with the puck? That's not actually what we think. Face-offs are important, but not, you know, it's not it's not really something to write home about when your team is this bad. But for a team that's a Stanley Cup contender, that's a guy who makes a difference. So, yeah, they target Luke Lendenning. And the third one is Mark Stahl, who, okay, you know what? There's been games where Mark Stahl hasn't been as bad as we joke. I think a lot of that's being propped up by Troy Stetcher, but I digress. As long as Mark Stahl has the appearance of looking good and Eisman and Blashill are very intentionally playing with Stahl for a lot of minutes to give him that visibility to other teams, which I think is actually really smart. Um, those are three guys where I would bet all three get moved. So I'm going to make a, uh, I'm going to have a small tangent before I circle back to these three, because obviously this is exciting for a number of reasons, but Mark Stahl is on the list of UFAs other teams are targeting. So how bad are the rest of the UFAs that nobody's targeting them? That's how bad this team is. They have like seven other pending unrestricted free agents that teams just are like, nah. <laughs> but anyways. Um, yeah, it's not it's not great. They're definitely looking for the veteran leadership, right? Like, Oh, yeah. Well, Darren Helms, they don't want, zero assists. Nobody's looking at him. They don't want do- uh, dynamic offensive dynamo Adam Ernie. He crashes both nets. <laughs> oh, so is Mark Stahl. Mark Stahl has like, what, 10 goals between both his net and the other teams this year? If I'm remembering correctly, he has six. Two for the Red Wings, four for the opponent. <laughs> okay, you know what? I don't count the Barkov one against him because I think Barkov was the last one to touch that. So let's Still. call it five. Still. <laughs> I don't think any of those guys get higher than a at best second round pick. I think you're looking at a likely story here where you get a third for Bobby Ryan, that kind of thing. Yeah, third for Bobby Ryan, a fourth for Glenn Denning, and literally anything for Mark Stahl, and I'm ecstatic. I actually think, you know, I take it back. If Glenn Denning is still this top face-off man, face-off man at trade deadline time, man, that's the kind of thing GMs are going to fixate on. I could see a GM overpaying for that. I'm not talking first-round pick, but I'm talking like second or a prospect they shouldn't be moving, that kind of thing. Like, it it's uh he's shining hard in that one category and it only takes certain things to get the weird gms you know weird gm juices flowing like that's the chirelli that's the the old school guys they love that shit you can almost predict what team he'll get traded to just based on who's the gm so uh good ch- so we need old school gm of good team so glenn denning's likely targets are the islanders Pretty pretty good candidate there. Uh, Mark Bergevin's kind of a throwback. Montreal could be on the on the Glenn Denning radar because God knows they don't have enough depth forwards. Uh, who else? Come on, Ryan, help me out here. Can't just be me. I thought Eiserman and uh, Jeff Gor- is it Gorton or Gordon or they only do business with one another. They seem to always make trades. Oh, with the Rangers, with, yeah, yeah, yeah the, the Rangers. Lightning but, and the Rangers. But the Rangers suck. 
with that bus laughing in the air. We didn't want him anyways. Ken Holland, protege, Jimmy Nil out in Dallas. I don't know if Nil would do that one. I don't know either. Jim Nil seems too smart for that, truthfully. Okay, I don't even think it has to be the old school GMs because I don't think it's necessarily a bad move to trade for a guy like Luke Lendening. I think Luke Lendening is a great bottom of the lineup player to have as long as it's the only way you're deploying him. He is a fantastic fourth line center and nobody in their right mind should ever pay a second round pick for a fourth line center. Hey, he can play a third line effectively. No, he can't. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe on the Red Wings. <laughs> well, on no, the Red Wings. He, no, he can't. <laughs> <laughs> That's also true. <laughs> See, because the trick, the thing is, Ryan used the word effectively there. <laughs> can he play on the third line? Yes. Should he? A, no. <laughs> I have a lot of time for Luke Lindenning. Like I, when Luke Lindenning's at, uh, in a rut. Like we have to acknowledge that Luke Lindenning is often overperforming more. Like I think he's over. He overperforms more often than he underperforms. It's just that. He's often asked to play on the first line, which is like that's a, that's insane. That's that should never have happened. He has one goal in forty six games. Leave him alone, Brad. Okay, I, oh, there's, yeah, there's enough not, to we're hate. Not, we're not going to leave him alone. We're going to leave him in Carolina or somewhere else. <laughs> there's enough to be mad at on this team. I don't like taking it out on Glenn. No, but no. Here's anyways, the here's the thing. It sounds like I'm being facetious to Luke Glendening. I love Luke Glendening. I want Luke Glendening to get traded, not only because the Red Wings will get an asset out of Luke Glendening, which is nice. I legitimately want to see Luke Glendening win a Stanley Cup. Send him to a team where he can win a Stanley Cup. Send him to Tampa Bay. I don't care. I want Luke Lindenning to get a cup. I want Bobby Ryan to get a cup. I like almost everybody, probably everybody on the Red Wings, actually. And I feel bad for them that they have to play for the Red Wings. Evan, did you have you seen that TikTok or video floating around of the two guys on the podcast? And one of them is saying, like, uh, he's telling a story. He's like, anyways, I grabbed this Tupperware. And his co-host was like, what? He's like, Tupperware. He's like, say that again. But oh, smoke. yeah, yeah. It's uh, Sal from Tactical oh. Jokers and the other dude. Yeah, he's like, Tupperware. He's like, okay, one syllable at a time. He's like, Tub? He's like, wrong. He's like, it's Tupperware. And I feel like, I constantly feel like the guy who says wrong to Brad. Whenever Brad's talking, he says a word. I'm like, Brad, what do you think that word means? And I often have to suppress it. I don't, know what, it I don't know what one you were getting at works. there, but. No, nah, it's okay. I'll leave that up to the, uh, the, the listeners as a mystery. Okay, um, quick predictions before we move on. I'm going to fire off the name and you tell me what what is a reasonable expectation if a trade goes through. Luke Lendenning. Fourth. Third. Uh, Bobby Ryan. Third. Third. Mark Stahl. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Just stock, the, just stock the Gatorade machine for a year. Not, for not. a year. Whoa. That's cheap. Okay, well, more on that to come. I'm excited for the trade deadline to see who's kicking tires. I, I love when that that phrase floats around. That's how you know it's that season starting up. Kicking tires. Kenny Holland special. We don't get a lot of that now with Eisenman. It's no more kicking tires. It's uh, it's uh, I know someone who knows someone who thinks Eisenman would be interested. In it. It's like ah, that's nothing, man. Tell me, the, say the say the line, say the kicking tires line. The New York Islanders won a game last week, four to one, forty one. Oh, hey, whoa, whoa, you know too much, Brad. <laughs> uh, news from around the league pretty quickly here. Um, Mark Bergevin has seen enough and uh, has decided that Montreal, after a pretty hot start, should be better than fourth in the North Division right now. Claude Julien and one of the assistants have been fired. So just going to make a quick note that you can, in fact, fire a coach this season. Um, uh, I don't know what to make of this. Because before the season, I made it very, I, I said it very clearly. I didn't think the Canadians were going to be that good. And then they came out of the gate and made me look like an absolute asshole. And then they've, and now they've been terrible for the last, what, eight, nine, 10 games. And the, out of all the players on their roster right now, the player with the highest point total in a single season in a Habs jersey is Tomas Tataro with 61, and he's been recently a healthy scratch. This team's just not that good. And I think it's a testament to Claude Julien, 
that he got them to play the way they did to start the season for as long as they did. And I think that their recent skid's probably a little closer to what they actually are as a team. I don't think they're that bad as because they, they're like 0-6-2 and two or something like that with a couple losses to Ottawa. But So I don't think they're that bad. But yeah, I, I think Bergevin has a lot of confidence in the roster he built. And now it's Dominic Ducharme's turn to try and turn that around. Um, I don't think Bergerman should have that much confidence in it, but hey, Dominic Ducharme's a, a great coach. At least he has been at the junior level. So you never know. I'm here for maximum chaos. You said they haven't been that good. They're 6-0-4 in their last 10. They're one of the better 5v5 teams in the league. They're what in their the- last 10? 6-0-4. Montreal. Oh, no, no, no. I'm looking at the wrong column. Sorry. I was looking at stupid, a stupid computer. Uh, they're 6014 on the road. They just happened, it happened to add up to 10 games. So I was like, that's what okay. it is. No, they're 4 4 and 2 in their last 10. You're right. Yeah, okay. I'm that's stupid and wrong. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Either way, and that was enough to get Claude Julien fired. <sighs> I've, I am wondering what's the obsession with Mark Bergevin. I, I, like, I, Admittedly, he's made some moves that I was surprised by in a positive way. I was like, okay, that's not the Mark Burch event that I've relentlessly ripped on for years. Um, but overall, this is the team that he put together. He said no to the hard rebuild at a point where it looked like Montreal maybe should have. He said yes to, you know, really buying his way back into contention. This is the plan. This is the path that Montreal is hard down now. Like, there's no turning around. Mark Bergevin's next coach, after uh, you know the interim coach here, whether it stays, uh, you know, his name's Ducharme, Dominic Ducharme. Yep, Dominic Ducharme. If he stays on permanent head coach or whoever else it is, he needs that guy to bring this team to playoff success. Otherwise, his plan has failed. And I don't know. I just don't have a lot of hope. I think I agree with you, Brad. Like. It's it's impressed me how much they've been able to do for sure. I, I thought Montreal would be on a different path now, but I'm I'm kind of surprised that Bergevin's getting another crack here. I'm surprised that he's getting another coach. Yeah, and and it's funny too because I think the media just wants Montreal to be good because they want that rivalry with Toronto, and and admittedly that'd be fun as hell. Um, so they kind of everywhere I looked in, and and. I know most of our listeners are American. Keep in mind when I'm talking the media in context of Montreal, it's the Canadian media, TSN, Sportsnet, etc. Almost every one of them pegged Montreal as the that had the best offseason in the entire NHL. And I'm like, did they? The Jake Allen move was pretty good. Uh, the Toffoli move was great. Uh, Josh Anderson certainly is was going to and is helping them in the short term, but his contract's probably going to turn into one of the worst in the league within four or five years. And he signed for eight. I mean, the Yes Perry Kotkaniemi picks looking terrible. Not that Kotkaniemi is a bad player, but he's he's not gonna. It's like the Rasmussen pick. He's not gonna live up to a top ten pick, and he was picked third overall. Teams are now focusing on Nick Suzuki, so he's seen a lot of regression. Shea Weber's not that young, right, buddy? Um, it's just, and but you want to know the biggest crux of this all, and the thing that absolutely is probably Claude Julien's downfall. Carey Price hasn't been good for a while. And I'm not talking just he hasn't been good for the last few games. He hasn't been good for the last few seasons. He has been a below average goaltender in the NHL, statistically speaking, for the better part of three or four years now. And he's still got a long time left at $10.5 million per. Now, Carey Price has a talent. He could turn it on, steal games. I get it. Carey Price is not a lost cause. But... That's that's a problem. Montreal has locked into a lot of contracts for a long time that aren't really helping the team all that much. So I don't know. Uh, let, let's just put it this way. I'm glad Montreal's in Detroit's division again for the next uh, however many years. Because, yeah, they'll be all right now, but I don't think this is looking up for them long term. I, I, I think I saw a stat that said Claude Julien's never been fired with a losing record. Yeah, his team's... <laughs> His team has been in a playoff spot every single time he's been fired. Mm -hmm. My one buddy's a diehard Habs fan, so I was kind of curious what he thought on it. And he actually thought it was the right time to move on from Julian. He said their systems don't look good. Their special teams don't look good. He's just said, Hmm. um, 
Yeah. <laughs> I was like, are you me? Um, he said like the team just wasn't playing good. And, and he, he was saying to me that the key for Montreal to, to have wins is for that team to, to play as one single unit. They don't have one superstar to carry them over, uh, into a win. Um, and he said, they're just not doing that right now. And he said he wasn't surprised and it sounded, he said he was kind of relieved that, uh, Julian was let go. Um, and let's be honest, Montreal wasn't good last year. The only reason why they won anything was because Carey Price went God mode. Yeah. Um, so, you know, yeah. you live and die by your goalies a lot of, a lot of the time. <sighs> Montreal's going to get another kick in the can. Uh, fan, Montreal fans have to hope that, A, they don't run, run into the Red Wings because that's, you know, four easy losses each year. Um, but, B, that, that they find some kind of unlikely success again where things fall in their favor. And it that starts and ends with Carey Price because without that, they don't have a team to compete with Toronto. They don't have a team to compete with the Tampa Bays. They don't really have a team to compete with Boston long-term year in and year out. And uh, they're kind of handcuffed. They have to be down this path. So, yeah, we'll see what happens. Um, for everyone clamoring and saying, should Claude Julien be hired by Detroit? No. No. You know. <laughs> nope. I'll, I'll give it's it nothing against Claude Julien, but I'd rather wait and have Eisman, you know, get the guy that he's 100%. Like, this is the guy I want for the team. There's no point in going through all this just to, I don't know. Can uh, Talking about living and dying by your goaltender. How did how does Chicago have twenty four points right now? They've Dude. played more games than everybody else because <laughs> Detroit gets nothing good in the world. Detroit gets nothing good. Also, just want to double back when I say no to Claude Julian. I mean like no, don't hire him immediately right now. Long term, that's what Eisman wants, and yeah, sure. But it's not as if like I don't think Eisman's going to jump at this. But yeah, Chicago is just going. I don't know. They deserve a lot of credit, I think. It's yeah, I thought it was some big brainer by saying they'd be uh, last place in this division, which they still could be. But that would mean Detroit would have to find 11 to 12 points by the end of the season. <laughs> I don't know if that's going to happen. <laughs> Are they going to get 11 or 12 more points total before the end of the season? Oh, God. The, we're over a third of the way through this season. Like, Don't even joke about that. <laughs> don't look at Detroit's strength of schedule for the rest of the year. Uh, well, they play the two weakest teams in the division. I still think Chicago is a bit of an aberration. Um, they've played more games, yada, yada, yada. But uh, uh, we played one more game than Chicago. Well, yeah, but we suck. We don't rel- we, we're not, <laughs> we don't matter in the standings. Like when I'm looking at the top of the central, I'm looking at, okay, Florida's in first, Tampa's in second, but Tampa's only a point behind with a game in hand. Like that matters. <laughs> Dallas has played like six games this year because they keep getting everyone sick. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the, uh, yes, Detroit might have played one more game, Evan, but it actually takes five games for Detroit to play three full periods of hockey. So you it sure that feels like it into your fancy stats. All right. Uh, I am going to move us along here. We're going to jump into overtime. And on this episode of the Winged Wheel podcast, that is proudly, proudly brought to you by the FanDuel Sportsbook, who we are excited to be partnering with. Uh, they're the number one sportsbook in America for so many reasons, from the ease of use for registration, deposits, finding great bets and awesome deals. Withdrawals are quick and easy. You get your money back in as soon as 24 hours. More on that after, though. What we want to do is continue our little run here of making some picks. Let's talk about some odds and some bets uh, on some upcoming upcoming games and uh, see which one of our hosts can win you the most money. I think Evan's winning right now. Someone made a comment. They're like, Evan won me some money, so I'm a patron now. So good job. Um, did we keep track of our last picks? Uh, I'm not going to be the one to do it, so... I did very well in our first uh, segment of this, and I did very poorly in our second one. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> I think I called for Detroit to split. Uh, yeah, yeah, we talked about this last episode. I called for Detroit to split against Florida, but... I think the only one I got right was that I was pretty sure Toronto was going to come out and lay an egg in the first game against Calgary, and they did. I think I also right. said take the over, which I definitely got wrong, but I, I had Calgary winning the game, and that was the only good advice I gave. I'm going to I'm going to name a few money lines here and we're going to talk about our picks. Um Dallas at Florida tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Uh Florida's the favorite here. I like Dallas. They're on a heater and Florida's bound to not regress but cool down. 
Yeah, you're not making any money on a lot of these, the betting line when it's minus 130, right? Like, if Dallas is on a heater, their odds are a little bit better. Take them. Make your money. Make your money. I go for the safe money. I say go Florida. It's not, not every bet's going to be a huge win. I don't even think that's necessarily, quote unquote, a safe money win because in the points percentage, which we were just talking about, Dallas and Florida, you know, there's not a big difference there. What's attractive to me is the under, like if you take under five and a half goals, that's the bigger payout there. The way Florida goaltending is playing and the way the way both Kadobin and uh, Drieger are playing, I'm taking the under there. Yeah, Hudobin's riding a two-game shutout streak right now. He made, what was it the other night? He made like 50 saves or something stupid like that. I, I saw he stopped 62 of the last 64 shots he's faced. Which Hammer I got the both um, I don't know how your fantasy league is going. I'm, I think I'm third overall, but I had to scrap together my goalies and the two that I picked up were Hudobin and Drieger. So I'm very happy right now. <laughs> yes, COVID has ravaged my team. <laughs> Uh, Carolina and Tampa Bay, that one continues, um, with Tampa, of course, being the favorite and the under also being the favorite. I like Tampa in the over here. Tampa is a team that can score a lot of goals. Carolina is scoring a lot now, which is not a normal trait of theirs, but yeah, Tampa's kind of corrected course and, uh, they seem poised to flex on the rest of the division again. I have a very hard time betting against Vasilevsky. That's all I got on that one. So I, Tampa I, and the under from Evan. <laughs> you, yeah, like I, I don't think the odds are very good on Tampa, and that's probably, probably a good reason for that. Uh, yeah, I would take Tampa, and I'm going under. Is it that they're the reigning Stanley Cup champions? Do you think that's, that might be it? No, just because Vasilevsky is just ridiculous all the time. Oh, that's I'm assuming he's starting, which I think is a safe assumption. So yeah, the the Hurricanes actually took the first game of the series for nothing, and then Tampa took it for two for the next one. I've been impressed with Carolina this year, and I think the only reason they're playing so well is because Brad didn't call for them to to do well this year. So that's cosmic justice. Carolina, yeah. There's no way I didn't have them top three in the division. I was hotter to draw on Carolina than you were. Yeah, it doesn't mean I was down on them, you dick. Yeah, well, from my point of view, relatively um, speaking. If you're if we're talking if we're talking early like what we were saying earlier, you want to swing and, and make a little bit more money. Betting on Carolina betting on Carolina. I'm not sure I'm slamming the over. The over set at over under set at six and a half. I I'll take the safe under there, but swing on Carolina, man. Uh that's that's my pick. Calgary, Ottawa. I don't even want to talk about that one because I'm not betting on I just I'm sorry I'm not putting money on Ottawa. Okay. Let's let's take a different approach here, okay? Because yeah, these are two teams I don't think anybody really wants to talk about, it, other than the fact that I don't think David Riddick slid in a goal against Toronto in go over five periods now. Which Kachuk do you want to bet on? Matthew or Brady? Is there an oh, over-under for funny. penalty minutes between those two? Because I'm smashing the over. That's funny. Why did, Calgary just always seems like a team in dysfunction. So if you have to pick a team to lose to the Sens... It's Montreal. It. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't have a money line for that right now. Whatever, whoever the dead, the worst team in the league is, you bet your ass Montreal is going to lose to them a ton. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Calgary, I, I mentioned it last time going into the Leaf game, into their series with the Leafs. They seem to be at the precipice in terms of their season. Like it's going to go off the rails, or they're going to. This is the start of their turnaround. And they had to play desperate. And they played great in the first game against Toronto. I don't know the score of the game uh, right now for tonight, but it was 0-0 with four minutes in the second last I saw. So if they can do that to Toronto and carry some confidence over to Ottawa, there's no reason Calgary shouldn't blow the doors off the Sens. Now, they're Calgary... So I'm not saying that with a supreme degree of confidence, but I I think if Calgary can pull out the win against Toronto or at least keep this game close like they have, they can ride a good wave of confidence into Ottawa and and for their sake, hopefully rattle off a couple wins. All right, last fan duel odds here we'll talk about. Um, if you didn't like my previous pick of taking Carolina to take the to take the underdog, the LA Kings are hot right now. 
They're up against the St. Louis Blues. That's no easy task, but the LA Kings are hot. They're playing well. They're playing really good hockey. Yeah, it's on the road, but hey, if you want to risk it, make a little bit more money. Take LA, take the under if you want to be a little bit safer. It's set at five and a half. I don't mind that bet. I'm not sure I'd make that one over the Carolina one if you're if you're only looking to take one underdog here on FanDuel.com, but uh, LA is not a bad one. I like the under. I definitely like the under in this game. I, I, LA, another team that took a couple swings in the roster spots with some good young players. Gabe Velarde's having a pretty good season so far. I, I like the under... I, I want to ride the LA wave. That's probably the bet I make, but I mean, it is St. Louis. <laughs> they are not that yeah. far removed from winning a Stanley cup. <laughs> All right, guys, uh, make sure to download the FanDuel Sportsbook app to get started and even have a risk-free bet of up to $1,000. No strings attached. If you win, you keep the cash. If you lose, you'll get up to $1,000 back in site credit. Be sure to sign up with promo code WWP so they know the Winged Wheel podcast sent you. That's FanDuel Sportsbook, promo code WWP. You have to be 21 and older and present in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Illinois, West Virginia, Indiana, Colorado, Iowa, Tennessee, Virginia, or Michigan. First online real one, real money wager only. Site credit is non-withdrawable and expires in 14 days. Restrictions apply. See sportsbook.fanduel.com for details. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-522-4700 in Colorado. 1-800-BETS-OFF in Iowa. 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana. 1-800-GAMBLER in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Virginia. Uh, Tennessee Redline 1-800-889-9789. www.1800gambler.com net in West Virginia or call 1-800-270-7117 in Michigan. All right. How many times did you practice that today? Uh, actually, not at all. Was that a good one? Yeah, you're getting better. Yeah, thanks, man. Overtime. Midweek episode means it's uh, Patreon exclusive. Let's start with Hon- Hunter Saunders. Uh, the day that Helm is off the roster is a day I'll celebrate sincerely. Have a great day. <laughs> uh K Stangy says, uh, justify this question as both Blashill and then Stevie. Hi, Chris, longtime listener, first time caller. Please tell me your rationale for putting Helm on the top line while Sveshnikov sits on the taxi squad. Oh, God. As uh, Blashill first, yeah. uh, good veteran leadership, works hard. We'll get the puck in the corners for the skill guys. The pragmatic Eisman answer will be that guys are hurt. Not everyone can play on the top line, they want to mix it up. What's going is what's there is obviously not working all the time, so they're just trying to find a spark. Are we giving uh, r- real Eiserman answers or generic GM speak? Mm, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it, they melt. If he's being honest, he, his answer: Why is Darren Helm on the top line? I really like William Eklund and Owen Power. <laughs> uh, Brent Rasmick says, "What's a realistic timetable for the following players to be in the lineup?" Okay, Valeno. Net midway next season. I agree with that. If not late next season. Uh, Cider. The first game he's available. It has to be next. It has to be the start of next season. I think if uh, there's a reality, he plays some games this year. Not many because of the schedule, but I, I think there's a reality. Uh, and Raymond, I'd say not next season, but the season after. Yeah, one more. So he'll finish the season in the SHL. I've got a gut feeling he'll spend a year in Grand Rapids, uh, maybe next year in the SHL, but then he'll be a regular Red Wing after that. Uh, Haroon Khan says, hey, guys, this last game pushed me, and I'm sure many others over the edge. Uh, I don't comment much because it's getting frustrating, and I don't want to add to the frustration uh, because everyone's better at articulating what I'm thinking in my mind. But what are we building here? What are the Red Wings really doing? What's the goal? Uh, What are the systems? I'm not a coach, uh, but what's the reasoning to put Nielsen in the top line in practice? If you're not playing Svetch, let him feel good by putting him there in practice at least and maybe pumping his morale. Uh, Everywhere you look, it's a bunch of sadness. Power play sucks. Uh, the lottery is sad. The coaching staff is sad. Uh, oh, and he's talking about Blash always pulling his mask down. Uh, I look forward to watching these guys after uni lectures. And hell, I opened my macroeconomics lecture rather than watch all that. <laughs> they sucked the life out of me. <laughs> okay. Sorry for making you read this out, but I need to get it out there. Everyone else I know who watches hockey is a Leafs fan. Haroon, we feel you, buddy. Okay, so here's my best logical answer that I can give given everything that's happened is going to happen and the long-term outlook. Cause I went on record number of times saying, I don't know what the hell Eisenman's doing in the sense of he's not putting 10 rookies in the lineup next year. So what is, 
the plan there. So what I think might be Asman's plan, he doesn't care what happens with the lineup right now. He really doesn't. He doesn't care if Franz Nielsen's on the first line, fourth line, or in the press box. He's not recalling anybody. That's the the short and fast of it. He knows he's probably selling off four or five guys at the deadline. There's four or five roster spots for the rest of the season. All right, let's give... I'm just going to pick names on my ass. Giovanni Smith a taste. Michael Rasmussen some run. Taro Hirose a bit of run. Okay. Those guys are acclimated to the NHL because they played their 15 games or whatever it is this year. Now they're not viewed as rookies next year per se. Now we can bring up Chalosky. We can bring up Valeno, whoever the hell you want. So it's kind of a staggered approach. So we might see a a crew of guys at the deadline this year, a crew of rookies at the start of next season, and another crew at next year's trade deadline that makes some sense to me but uh yeah in the meantime it stinks um tyrone biggums brand garpart poop nuggets never change says uh since montreal fired their coach there's a possibility for us also my fantasy team is getting pumped they lost all but one week have a lot of people hurt or out with COVID. what can i do to not feel the pain uh work the waiver wire buddy uh brad's anger manifested who is a brand new patron welcome oh, says no. finally, i don't, I don't oh no <laughs> says i finally won enough money of evan's hockey picks to join patreon thanks evan hey thanks evan you're there welcome you uh side note stall was responsible for another goal against us glenn denning leads the league in face-off percentage and the red wings lose again the universe continues as it should rank the following events as they are going to happen soonest to latest one, Tyler Bertuzzi returns. Two, wing score power play goal. Three, Blashill gets fired. Four, Brad appreciates the contributions of Darren Helm. Um, okay. Bertuzzi returns first. Power play goal second. Blashill third. Uh, Darren Helm to my grave. <laughs> Bertuzzi is week to week. I actually think Helm will have a good game of forcing Brad to recognize him first. No, uh, that, did, did you see the little experiment I did uh, with yesterday's game? No, I. Uh, yeah, no, I no, I'm yeah. not. I, I even if even if he does something, I'm not going to point it out. I just out of principle at this point. Darren Helm's going to end the power play drought. Oh, I'll be happy, and I will not tweet about it. Is. He absolutely is, and you know it. And it Cody will be Stark- in the most Darren Helm way possible. It's going to be a double deflection that hits him in the back of the head and goes three inches across the line. Cody Stark says, might as well put me in on the first line. I told Franz good game once three years ago after a wild game. Didn't mean this. <laughs> uh, Callan S says, please discuss. I think the better play defensive play has come from all five players playing better in their own zone. Always good to have better D in your own end. Is that at the expense of being in the right position to break the puck out or do anything remotely offensive? No, those nope. two things flow into each other. Like they, There shouldn't be a hard disconnect there. Yep. Uh, also, who's the best face-off guy in Detroit this year? I don't know, but tune in to the next broadcast to find out. Robbie Fabry. Michael Barry says, so Ottawa and Detroit had the same points percentage. Who ends up with more points at season's end? Ottawa. Yeah, I'll go Ottawa here. Also, this year is the toughest for Wings fans. We're bad, and Blashill runs a boring system. Keep sending out the same old vets uh, without trying anything new. I mean, personally, I can accept being bad if we're trying new things, but we simply aren't. Uh, Michael Lang says, Sup, guys, I'm going to show solidarity with Evan. Jackson Hole is where it's at. I'm curious if Evan's ever been to Moab, Utah, or if it's on his bucket list. I have not, but skiing in Utah is on the list. Yeah, that's another fake place you've named just to test Brad and I. You know you've got Evan money when like you're like yeah Utah why not Utah. On to the hockey question: Who's the worst coach in the league right now? Not trying to open the door to dunk on Blashill again. Just curious. Like, are we if we're not allowed to pick pick Blashill just because you know low hanging fruit? Um, there's. There's some contenders out there. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of teams underperforming. Uh, a lot of fan bases very angry. Um, I'm gonna go John Hines. I I don't I didn't get that hire from the start. Neither did I. Uh, he he was the exact wrong type of coach for for Nashville. But hey, if they want to double down on their problems, they sure as hell did it effectively. 
Sam Shayer says this might be unpopular, but I think we have to start considering blaming Eisenman for this season's coaching decisions. Understand you want you don't want GM's coaching, but his complacency with abhorrent coaching shouldn't be ignored. If you let your employees routinely perform poorly, that's a reflection on you. What Brad said earlier with like, I don't think Eisenman, there's a chance Eisenman just doesn't care what happens with the personnel this year. I think, sadly, that might have a modicum of truth. I'm not sure completely. Of course, there's no way really of knowing. I just don't think Eisenman thinks it's as big of a deal. Um, or he's saying, well, Svetch is going to get in. Like, just because it wasn't this last game doesn't mean he won't get in, which is fair. I I legitimately think this is why Iserman's keeping all the prospects away from Detroit for as long as he can because he he knows he knows that this is a train wreck and we we've talked we said the same thing last year we just hoped it wouldn't be the case this year as well but look at how boring awful and unable to produce offense this team is my argument in favor of what they're doing is do you want Smith Hiroshi Rasmussen or Svechnikov around this. No, I, I think it's hurting their development in some cases, but the alternative in terms of mentality could yield a worse effect. So I don't know. I don't, I wish I had a good answer, but I don't. Charlie said, Larrick says, I always go back and forth for the craziest fan base between the Leafs and the Habs. Oh, you got to include Vancouver in there. Uh, Leafs Boston? fans. Yeah. Leafs fans moan just a moan or sorry, bitch, just a bitch, but that's Toronto sports. Over in some dark woods in Quebec, lit by the full moon, Habs fans are sacrificing some animal for a decent season and demand blood if it doesn't happen. Uh, am I missing anything? Claude doesn't seem too bad. What other teams do you see firing their coach before the season is up? None. I'm surprised even one happened. I don't think Detroit's doing it during the season. There's Here's the probably the sad reality of it. We've seen how this season went has gone for Detroit, and we're over a third of the season already. It would have happened by now. Uh, Nate Schwartz says, I'm exhausted. Fire Blash already. I almost fell asleep during the last game. Franz on the first line. Oh, that guy, that per, that comment was all three of us. I'm the I'm exhausted part. Brad's the Fire Blash already. And Evan's the I almost fell asleep during the last game. And then Brad again is Franz on the first line. Question mark, question mark. Yeah. Uh, and Nick also Putty's the I'm exhausted. And I'm also the I fell asleep through the game. <laughs> Nick Putty says, just want to share a random story. I was out on the ice for my girls U8 game on Sunday. The other coach mentions to me between periods that Rafalski was in our lobby. He was coaching a team on another sheet. It was decked out in wings gear. In retrospect, I should have stopped by to get a picture as they were just scrimmaging, but I was on zero sleep from an overnight brewing night and didn't think of it till I got home. Well, I'm sure he'll be back there. So uh, give him a, a podcast sticker. <laughs> uh, Cyril Rabitsky says, can we take a moment to appreciate just how awful the Red Wings power play has been this year? They've scored 2.08 goals per 60 on the power play. Good for not only last place in the league this year, but it's the worst rate by almost a full goal going back to 07 08. This season, there's 24 teams who score more often at even strength than the Red Wings do on the power play. Burt has three power play goals in nine games. Mantha has one. End of list. There's 12 players that have scored more power play goals this season than the Red Wings have as a team. They have to regress to the mean at some point, right? Yeah. I have. I can only hope. Sid Phyllis says, "Do you think Ozzy hates John Keating? <laughs> Just watch Ozzy as Keating is talking. You'll see it." I don't know. I think that I think those guys have one of the hardest jobs in the world. They have the hardest uh, job in sports right now, and that's as much as I rip on them for how much they beat the Luke Glendening faceoff stat to death. I mean, what the hell else are they going to say positive? Franz Nielsen tied his skates without drooling today. <laughs> Oh, wait, no. Yeah, never mind. Uh, La Plata Peak says, Eisenman keeping Blash around only makes sense from a financial perspective, when in this day and age it's pretty significant, the owner being in the business of wings and pizza notwithstanding. Having said that, I can't imagine a scenario where Blash is retained past this year. Therefore, discussions about his replacement should supersede any draft talk on this podcast going forward. I mean, yeah, we can continue. We we probably should revisit some of the replacement conversations once we get to like the three-quarter way mark. And that's a really good point. It costs money to fire a coach and bring in a new one. Because if you fire a coach, they still collect their full check. If you want to know how much uh, uh, Mike Babcock is making from his insane record-breaking coaching deal he signed with Toronto, uh, the full amount. Every single year he doesn't coach in the NHL, he still collects that check. So, yeah. That's a dream right there. Right. And then, anyway. and then you could end up coaching in the league while also getting paid by that new team. It's like compounding yeah. salaries. 
well, that's when the you, gig you want. When you get hired by the new team, they assume like the team that was paying you before they pay you uh, whatever they owed you less what the new team is paying you. Oh, well, yeah. never mind then. You don't get that's to double worth dip it. that hard. Just don't uh, work. Darren Helm Stand Club says blast the taxi squad. Oh, frick. New Jersey Devils tweeted Hughes's nickname. Anyways, this next comment from Rowan, otherwise known as Lil Jizzy. <laughs> no, what? Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm? You didn't see that? No. The New Jersey Devils account tweeted Lil Jizzy. That is Hughes's nickname. Jack Hughes, his, his nickname is Lil Jizzy. That, mm. Yeah. I oh, just, that's, no, but, that's not mm. going to backfire at all. I, I, I got, yep. <laughs> they, they, they tweeted out and they didn't delete. Jack Hughes's nickname is Lil Jizzy. Anyways, um, what's that, what's that meme noise? Like it's seven in the morning. That was my first thought when I read that. I was like, no, I can't deal with this today. Anyways, Lil, Lil Jizzy says, good day, dud duds. Look, I realize the Red Wings are, well, there's something, but we're all looking uh, overlooking the worst nickname in hockey. That's right. It's me, Jack Hughes, a.k.a. Lil Jizzy. Like, honestly, what the heck? In honor of this, please give each other questionable nicknames. Ready? Go. Okay, guys, keep this. Keep this where I don't have to edit it. Please, I beg of you. So we're just coming up with completely awful nicknames for each other? Yeah. Okay, for Ryan, I'm going to go with Big Umami. Oh, that's an amazing nickname. Come on. <laughs> uh... uh Evan's nickname is huge dumbass. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. I'm just going to call Evan Tiger. Um, oh, by the way, I hope Tiger's okay. Yeah, jeez. Yeah, that didn't uh that didn't that was not good. Anyways. Uh, what's our Evan, how do we make a nickname for Brad which isn't just relentlessly insulting him? I know that I've actually been struggling. I, that's yeah. the only one I've been thinking of. I'm like accessing that part of my brain and I like peek in and it's like, you piece of shit. Stupid <laughs> short. <laughs> I, I, uh, I'm so not creative. Uh, I'm yeah. going to move on at, at the aren't risk you, of... Aren't you there, Lobby? Um, oof. Yeah, hockey nicknames. They're Crisco. The uh, yeah, that's the You're... thing. My, my last name didn't work for hockey nicknames, so my teammates always just called me Crisco. Crisco, you're going to be greaser, greasy. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Very big, original. Big stonks down game versus Sabretooth cat team, but I'd say Glenn Denning and Bernie at least held their value decently. Jersey time, color on color in the second Lake Tahoe game was awesome. Go through the current divisions and set the best color on color matchups. You can use home away, third, or reverse retro if you want. Last and somewhat mercifully, there's 34 more heckin' games to go. Stay fresh, cheese bags. So we can't take any white jerseys, which means the Nordiques is out. Oh, yeah, that's true. Oh, um, sucks. Um, okay, so we got to go division by division. Let's start in the north because that's easy. Um, man. It's Toronto, little... Montreal. Yeah, Toronto, Montreal. Red, red, white, and blue. Red versus blue. Um, honorable Don't know which to... one's Tucker and which one's... But anyways. Yeah. Honorable mention to Ottawa and Edmonton's thirds there. Ottawa's sorry, black and Edmonton's. Oh no, that would be too much. That would be that'd be awful. Ooh, Edmonton's navy versus Calgary's reds. All right, you want to know my heinous answer for the central? You're gonna hate this. Rowan's gonna hate this. Everyone's gonna hate this. Detroit red, Dallas neon, black and green. Yep, I hate it. I don't even hate <laughs> Dallas's jerseys, but I hate that as the best. If, if you want to go full silly season, since we're actually no, I have it. I have it. It's the obvious answer, and I think Rowan will be with me on this. The Florida Retro Reverses versus the Hartford Whalers. Are the Hartford Whalers not whites? Uh, they're gray. Oh, uh, they're gray. Okay. And there's a lot of green equipment to go with it, and I think that would be a very colorful and aesthetically pleasing game. In the East, so just quickly here in the East, uh, Washington's thirds and Pittsburgh's uh, home jerseys. That's my answer. Washington's retro reverses for me against yeah 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 against the, Boston's yellow. Okay, I can deal with that. And then ooh, in the West, there's some you options got it. here. Arizona's retro reverse. Got to throw. But do we go there. with it or do you go Kachina? Okay, Either one. Actually. Hold on. If we're just going, yeah, I got it. Arizona's retro reverse. Minnesota's retro reverse. 
Ooh, I'll take that. I'll take that one. Okay, let's move along here. Uh, Evan's bingo card. Knowing what you know about this year's draft class, would you trade our first round pick in Mantha for Bowen Byram? Nope. No, that's too much. Uh, we score negative goals as is, and dealing Mantha certainly doesn't help. But I'm not super confident anyone on the left side, uh, on anyone on the left side, and sorry, of the defensive prospect pipeline. Byram gives us a for sure top four guy. Blah blah blah. I think it's too much. Uh, you, if you need a, a left got left shot defense on there, like a good prospect, uh, there's a lot of them in this upcoming draft. So just keep the pick. Ghost of podcast passes. What would you say your ideal five year plan for this podcast is? What about your realistic five year plan? Oh, I think he had an edit. Um, we continue to cover hockey, which we love to do, and the Red Wings get better, and we can cover a winning team again. That is all I can realistically hope for. Yeah, honestly, if uh, if, if you guys keep supporting us the way you do, I, I see a reality where maybe not in five years, but this could be our jobs. If you want to see us all over YouTube doing the podcast, doing more articles and stuff like that, yeah, give us 40, 50, 60 hours a week to do it. We could do it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm uh, not but- working 60 hours a week. <laughs> hey. Evan coming in. Evan coming in already trying to minimize labor. Evan, we're talking about the dream here. Yeah. Uh, no. Just, no if it's your job to watch hockey and talk about it, are you really working? Not working 60 hours a week. God Evan's... We'll build you a flex. Two of us will go full time and this will just be our jobs. <laughs> Bullying Brad on Twitter out of boredom says, imagine the contract conversation between Stevie and Bert's agent after they watched, watch this team completely fall apart when he got hurt. Bert just says, bitch, pay me. Uh, <laughs> CNOD says, turns out my joke about Vlad and Franz was a lot more typical than expected. Um, Nielsen got waived. I'm in the clear. Maybe I can get Bromeyer's fetch or someone on my line. This is in the perspective of Vlad. Blashill walks in. Franz, don't worry, buddy. I just needed some roster flexibility. Vlad, God damn it, I hate this place. <laughs> Insult to injury. Uh, Franz roof's a great setup. I'm sure he's a great guy, but this game hit a cl- his game hit a cliff like five years ago. Uh, Liz B says, I feel like calling up Svetch is actually some cruel joke. They're going to send him back to Grand Rapids on March 4th, just in time for Detroit's next Carolina game. Seriously, though, I like Svetch, and I think he can be an effective third to fourth liner, but if they're not going to let him play, trade him to a team that freaking will. Uh, Conrad Lincoln, the Black Lumberjack, says, first off, I just want to say that Brad refusing to wear a do-rag during Black History Month is an abomination. <laughs> You know exactly how uncomfortable you're making Brad, and I love you for that. Uh, <laughs> second off, let's pretend Blashill's a mixologist based on the lines he's put on the ice over the years. What are the contents of a Blashill signature cocktail after the Red Wings have just lost to the Blue Jackets 7-1? Are you having what he's having? He throws a tequila shot in your face and pisses on your foot. That's what it is. <laughs> He uh, he makes you a drink that you don't necessarily like, like maybe a martini that's just a little too heavy on the, I don't know, olives. And you're like, uh, I don't like it. Uh, can I try another one? And he makes you a martini that's too heavy on the olives. And you're like, no, I don't want this. And he's like, hold on, let me try something different. And he makes you a martini that has less olives. And then as you're about to take a sip, he drops in more olives. <laughs> and this is all while he's making weird faces at you. Yeah. <laughs> like he's confused that you don't understand the greatness he's creating. Yeah. <laughs> um, a night in with Ryan Hanna says, is Alexi Lafreniere the new Z- uh, Xavier Laflem? You see what I did there, Ryan? It's another movie reference, but seriously, what's going on with him? He's uh, young. He's 18. I die. It's there will be f- so few Crosby's, Malkin's, Matthews's of the world. He is going to, it's fine. He'll be fine. Lars, the prophet of the towering behemoth, says we suck so bad the Red Wings just sucked a little bit more there. there. If they did, there would be a black hole opening at the center of the at center ice in the LCA. So some positive things to even it out. Berggren has 40 points in 42 games. Sider has 24 points in 34 games and is one of the best defensemen in the SHL at 19. Johansson, Niederbach, Raymond, and the behemoth are all looking great and ahead of schedule. This is all really good stuff, even when it looks bleak. So it feels like we're going to get blown out every game. While it feels like that, the future is looking great. When we draft, when we draft uh, Jesper Wallstedt, we're all set for a new dynasty and there will be light in the world again. Uh, to infinity and beyond and wings and pizza for everyone. Um, is it just me or is Brad and Ryan a bit like Cliff and Norm? Who's Cliff and Norm? I don't know. 
Terry says, good day, dud duds. Terry here. What's with all these wannabe Terry's invading your timeline? I go into hiding because of a field trip to America's capital and they come out of the woodwork. Jersey time convinced crisis actor Rowan that the wild have an elite Jersey. I um, really do like Minnesota's jerseys. They're regulars yeah. and they're retro reverses. It's a good color scheme. I like the green and the cream. I like the solid bar on their home jerseys. I really like their how simple their road jerseys are, but it's done well. And their retro reverse is a thing of art. I looked it up, by the way. Um, Cliff and Norm are the guys from Cheers. Oh. Uh, Michael You're Thompson's... Norm. I'll look it up later. <laughs> I should watch Cheers. Michael Thompson says it's finally time to appreciate the elite nature of Black Shell, and we should reprieve all our casts uh, of transgressions, judgment, and wrongdoing for winning a superior challenge. Also, when I finished the last episode, my podcast player was on shuffle. For some reason, sent me back. Uh, and holy shit, the takes. Can't wait to see how dumb we all are the next time the wings are postseason bound. Until then, I, I guess we can keep it under lock and zid lich key. Also, I took Brad's advice and taped heel to toe and missed a wide open chance in beer league and convinced it's entirely his broken fault. Yet another oh. Terry says, uh, the actual Terry uh, says, hello, I'm proud to announce Bingo Night hosted by Evan Lobsinger. This new podcast will be joining the Winged Wheel Network and the debut episode will drop on March 5th. Come join Evan and his guest hosts uh, like Steve Ott, Darren Helm, Jimmy Howard, and many more. We'll talk not only hockey. Uh, well, most of the guest hosts will talk. Order your unique bingo card off our web. No, people are going to think they can they can actually get this. Um, and the first tweet with a verification picture of a completed bingo card will win an autographed winged wheel golf ball by none other than Mr. Evan Lobsinger. Hey, we should make custom golf balls. Yeah, you can on. Uh, no, uh, I can't say on. No free ads. I no think free ads. We have custom winged wheel podcast golf balls. I've still got the box that. Uh, I think it was Natalie sent us years ago. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but we I put still... our logo and stuff on these ones. Yeah, I know, but I, I have still got them. That was I still have like mine, my... too. Yeah. I'm not <laughs> using those on the range. They're too valuable. No chance. I know. Um, tape Job, a hockeymentary hosted by Brad Crisco, says, while you're reading this, Franz Nielsen is missing the puck two more times. Prison Honestly. Brad says, yo, I'm Prison Brad. The worst thing about the Red Wings is the Luke Glenn Dementors. Stay fresh, cheese bags. And D Larks says, what's up, boys? My best friend is a Leafs fan, and I recently made a drunk promise that when the Leafs win the cup, I'll put on one of his jerseys and party with him for the night. He's got a few jerseys, and I wanted your opinion on which one to wear. Domi, Curtis Joseph, Sandin, Mitch Marner, Morgan Riley, and last but not least, Phil Kessel. Okay, Phil the Thrill's tempting, but it's got to be Curtis Joseph just because he was a Red Wing. I mean, this is a blasphemous answer, and I just... He he's played for the two teams I hate more than any other teams in the history of hockey, but I I absolutely love Mitch Marner, so I'll always vouch for Mitch Marner, and I can't wait for the day he's not a Leaf. But uh, yeah, Mitch Marner. All right, with that, we're going to wrap up this episode. We will be back with you guys on Sunday night. We'd like to thank all of our listeners, everyone who tunes in, everyone who's been everyone who's been leaving uh, great ratings for us, who subscribed. Wherever you get your podcasts, you subscribed on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. Um, our sponsor, the FanDuel Sportsbook. Download the app and use promo code WWP. And our name level sponsors, Arjun Shanker, uh, Eve Bartell on behalf of the Sarah Grand Foundation, Brett Bailey, Terry, Taylor Tagel, Ryan Hubbard, RA, Zach Spring, Citizen High Five, Cody Stark, Greach, Jeremiah Dobo, Jake Kiefer, Andrew Bohan, Scott Martin, Jacob Turner, Matt McKay, Craig Kibble, Brandon M., Matthew M. Rice, Luke Johnson, Kaylin Wood, Hassam al Qasem, Hana Lee, Sam Bankson, Kevin McCracken, uh, Zach Van, Josh Yelton, another former junior goalie turned golfer, Trevor Pevavar, Evans Bingo Card, Connor Layton. Uh, this one isn't loading put c on my jersey uh matt keeler prison brad antonio gracias john evans joseph minima quaz and stan olson thank you all so much uh back with you sunday hope for something fun in these next three games 
Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.